get together in a campaign that we will okay. win. We will not let the machine continue to do what they were doing. So I ask you, will you join? If you're talking about really changing this city, will we join and work together, Latino, black, and brown, together? Thank you. The purpose of tonight's forum is to have candidates tell us their plans around important concerns from the community. This evening's questions were developed by residents from the West Side and other community organizations uh, working to change the conditions here in the community. We have another candidate that came. You could come around here and take a seat and we will introduce you. Please give a round of applause to Dr. Patricia Van Pell Walkins that just walked in the building. We want to thank her for coming and taking some time out of her day to be with us here. Um, so tonight we will focus on our candidates talking about plans around education, housing, workforce development, and jobs. After candidates respond to these questions, we will proceed with questions gathered from audience members. Um, there is a sign-in sheet outside for folks who want to ask questions to the candidates um, at the uh, second half of tonight's meeting. Uh, there will also uh, 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 be an opportunity if candidates like to be able to respond to some of the questions in more detail to the West Humble Park uh, portal that we have and also to Blocks Together's website. We're willing to let you know uh, candidates still continue to uh, speak to the residents by posting some of their information on those websites. Um, for our candidates and audience members, we do want to observe a couple of ground rules just to make sure tonight's meeting is respectful and smooth. So the first thing is we want to make sure our cell phones are turned down low. And if you got one of those loud vibrating phones, maybe turn that one on silent. <laughs> Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, audience members, we let the candidates speak, um, not to interrupt them, because we do want to keep each candidate's remark to about one minute. We uh, have a, one of our students from Orr High School in the building that will be helping us keep it uh, on time. Go ahead and stand up, Jermaine. <laughs> and we just want to make sure tonight's form is respectful, okay? So um, now I'd like to begin with some of the questions. And again, these questions were developed from community residents uh, throughout the neighborhood that uh, worked on stuff. That th these were the questions that they felt are important issues for some of the members here in, on the west side. So we would like each candidate to take uh, a minute to respond. We don't have any particular order, but we'll, we could go ahead and um, have each. We could start with Dr. Watkins since you're at the end, and then we'll proceed on to the rest of the candidates. OK? Also, um, we'll have each candidate have a closing remark so they could give a, 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 an overall sense to us, us in the audience about their plans for the city of Chicago, okay? But right now we're going to start with that question since we are running behind schedule. All right, the for a long time, uh, developers come into our community doing projects that do not benefit the residents that currently stay here. Sometimes they receive tax credits and tax increment financing credits, which is money taken from the property taxes of uh, blighted communities for redevelopment. They should provide job training, affordable housing, and opportunities for residents to get jobs. Here in some of the neighborhoods on the west side, we have residents making less than $25,000 a year, and they need affordable housing and job training for economic development. And this stuff could be uh, used with TIF dollars. If mayor, will you not only work with community organizations and residents to ensure that there are enforceable and binding community benefit agreements for those who use tax increment financing and other government credits? OK, to me, that's a no-brainer, because they're using our tax dollars. And they're spending our money. We should have a right to say how that money is spent. In the last 20 years, the city has fallen far away from listening to the residents' voice. I know a lot of you may have read in the newspaper how we lost 200,000 
residents in the last 10 years. And that's because people don't feel like they have a voice in decision making. And I tell you, I, I tell you today that if we don't make a change in the way that we are running this government, we're going to lose even more. So I, I encourage you to listen to the candidates today and, and let's vote for somebody that's talking about what you're talking about and living what you're living. Um, I've been in, uh, on the West Side all of my adult life, but, and I love the West Side. Um, I grew up in, in Cabrini Green, um, but I moved to the West Side as an adult, and, I, and I've seen firsthand the communities change over, turn over. It's up to us to do something about the turnover. It's up to us to demand that the changes take place that benefit not just people from outside the neighborhood, but people inside of this neighborhood to get stronger communities and stronger, uh, stronger uh, community organizations, stronger communities, and better schools. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Lots of familiar faces. I am going to say tonight something you've already heard many times, and that is that there's a lack of balance in growth and development in the city of Chicago. You look at what's happening downtown, you see the revitalization of neighborhoods all around downtown, but you indicated that there are developers that come in and then do, don't do what they're supposed to do, well, my concern is that you don't have very many developers coming in at all. Uh, and so we need to use tax increment financing, and we need to use other tools to not only bring development in, but have that development be led and stimulated by the community so that the community plays a role. All the community organizations are part of the development process. When we say community development, You've got to keep those two words together, community and development. And community should drive development, not downtown and not developers. Community should drive development because development means a whole lot of things. It means creating strong schools. It means creating small businesses. And it cre means creating housing opportunities for people. Thank you. I too feel like I'm amongst friends. I was here with you not too long ago when we had a budget hearing where Mayor Daly and his staff was here and we got a lot of good inf information but one of the most important things is we talked about Sweet Home Chicago's initiative to ensure that 20% of TIF funds go for housing in our communities and that's essential. Community, community benefits agreements are essential to communities like this, communities that are underdeveloped and communities that are not given the same respect as downtown communities. But the important thing is, what are the elements of the community benefit agreement? First of all, we have to make certain that the banks are lending money for projects that are germane to this community. Second, we have to make certain that when there's housing, for every one unit of market rate housing, we develop two units of low income housing especially when people are earning about $25,000 a year. It's important that you're not spending more than 28% of your income on housing. The next thing we have to do is make certain that there are jobs for the people in the community. Thank you. All right, for our second question, uh, we can actually start with um, Mr. Walls. The second question is uh, public schools in the city of Chicago have become backseat to some of the charters and selective enrollment schools when it comes to investment into programs and facilities. In 2009 and 2010 school year, the 92% of renovation money and facility investment money went to only 11 schools. All 11 schools were Renaissance 2010 schools. If mayor, how will you work to improve investment for neighborhood schools or reforming the current capital improvement program and CPS spending? As mayor, we're going to fight to ensure that we have a superior public school education for each and every individual child. And that transcends the development of modern buildings with state-of-the-art equipment and facilities, which are conducive to safe and potentially productive educational environments. It's really important that we have balance in terms of our investment dollars in these particular schools. The infrastructure dollars from TIF funds and from city funds have to go to make certain that all the schools are fairly developed. And I think those dollars should be parceled out on a per student basis. And then you don't end up with disparity. If we parcel out on a per student basis, schools in all neighborhood get the infrastructure improvement dollars that they need. 
The next thing we have to do is make certain we have a superintendent of, of schools and not a um, CEO of schools, somebody who's concerned about education first and not concerned about money, jobs, and contracts. We have to make certain that we're providing an education for every child and that that is not second rate or secondary. Thank you. We, we've developed a, a parallel system of public education here in the city of Chicago as a result in part of Renaissance 2010 and other initiatives. So on one track, charter schools, selective enrollment, and magnet schools. On the other track, the neighborhood schools. And what we've encouraged through the actions over the years is for families to run away from the neighborhood schools. We need to go back to strengthening our neighborhood schools. We can't build community. We can't stabilize communities if all the students are leaving the community to go to school. You build neighborhoods through strong anchors that are called schools. And we don't put parents in a position or students in a position where they struggle with where am I going to send my child to school because the school down the street is not good enough for my child. That's an important decision that gets made by a family. But I want them to be able to say that school down the street is a good school, it's a neighborhood school, and I want my Thank child you. to attend that school. Thank you. Number one, I think uh, we need someone over the schools that's an educator. We need a school administrator over the schools who has an education background. For the last 20 years, we've had, about 20 years, we've had business people running our schools. And they think that it's just like a business. And they've proven to be wrong. Even though they spent $50 million to Renaissance School Fund, they ra uh, raised $50 million and put it into the schools in the last few years, um, the schools are still not performing much better or any better than uh, the regular schools right now. And we, so I know that we need someone over our schools who knows what school is about. Number two, we need an elected school board. We need to get the citizenry back involved with the schools. Our schools are falling far behind the rest of the world. So we can't, we can't think that if we just sit down and be quiet and tell them to leave us alone that they're not going to do anything to our schools. Our schools are going to consistently change. So I want to have community councils that drive reform from the ground up. No more this top-down approach that we've had in this city, but ground up, pushing for the kind of changes we need in the kind of ch uh, schools that we need in our own neighborhood. And I'm committed to that, and not only committed to, to it, but willing to fund it, fund it also as mayor. Thank you. The next question we have is also a question related to schools. Uh, local school councils were started years ago as a way to decrease bureaucracy from sh uh, Chicago Public School Central Office uh, that was negatively affecting academic achievement in CPS. In recent years, the powers and resources for local schools have dwindled, in addition to charters and turnarounds not having them. Even though research shows that strong LSCs are a large part to a turnaround of a school, how will you as mayor work to strengthen local school council training and authority? I'm going to start. Uh, I was a state senator for 20 years. And in 1988, I was the Senate co-sponsor of the bill creating local school councils. And for all the years that local school councils have existed, I have fought for the right of not only local school councils to exist, because there have been attempts over the years by the board to eliminate local school councils, but also to ensure that the right training is provided and that parents are given an opportunity to, to develop into strong leaders uh, and community members on the school council are working in collaboration with the principal and the teachers and, and all the wonderful things that need to happen. The fact of the matter is that local school councils are an essential component from the very beginning. I said that they're the, really the heart of school reform. And if they're not functioning well, I'm not going to point the finger at local school council members. I'm going to look at that principal. I'm going to look at, at CPS. And I'm going to look at the fact that there isn't enough support for those local school councils. Thank you. Renaissance 2010 is a diabolical initiative that was designed to weaken the foundation of public education and facilitate the privatization of schools. One of the most important problems that we have with Renaissance 2010 is it promotes charter schools. And in charter schools, by law, that same law that they passed, you cannot have local elected school councils. So it disconnects parents and educational community activists from the process. 
The important thing is training. People who are properly trained can do the job adequately well. So we want to make certain that there's mandatory training for all persons who are members of the local elected school council and that that training is paid for by Chicago Public Schools and that that training is state of the art and that it talks about futuristic things like technology but it also talks about accounting procedures and how to determine who might be the best principal for a given school. All those things that fall within the purview of the local elected school council. So we have to do a whole lot more in terms of training people. Thank you. As you know, uh, local school councils were formed uh, over two decades ago. And the reason why they were formed was to take over the governance of the school so that the school could be controlled by local uh, groups, local pa parents and, and communities. Well, that worked really well. But it did, it did not have anything to do with the academic achievement of those students. Because the only thing the local school council could do was fire the principal or hire a principal and look over the budget. They had no control over what was happening in those classrooms. So I'm proposing to expand the, the, um, the, the responsibilities of the local school councils. I think that we need, to look, we need to come again with people who have been a part of local school councils to sit together and think about what needs to really happen with the local school councils 20 years later and how do we improve. And I think part of it is being able to look at the evaluation of teachers and have a role in, in determining which teachers stay and which teachers go. And also I think that in order to keep the local school councils going, we cannot look to the city to fund it because the local school council's job is to get on the city's case. So then, then the city is not going to keep funding you. I don't care who's mayor, somebody's going to stop funding you. It has to come from the state, and I'm really willing to advocate for funding, permanent funding Thank for local school councils from the state. Thank you. Our next question is about jobs, and we could start with you, Dr. Watkins. Job creation and job training is vital to communities here on the west side. In addition, in our community, we have many residents returning from prison in need of employment. If mayor, what programs or policies will you put in place to address the lack of jobs and job training for low-income people and ex-offenders? First of all, um, I, this is one of the things that got me out on the field of doing activism work anyway, the fact that 55% of the adult black males in Chicago have felony records. That means half of them can never get a job, basically, uh, never get into housing opportunities, never get into education opportunities, locked out for life, and yet forced to live among everybody else who have those opportunities. What I want to do is change the culture of the city the way the city is approaching ex-offenders. We, we need to start, start stop acting like the only people that did wrong was the ones that got caught, because a lot of people have done wrong, just didn't get caught. So I want, to, I want to fight to ban the box off all applications so that people will be judged by their skills and their abilities, not by their background. And I think we still have to do background checks, but after you get the job, they should be able to do the background check. Number two, I want to, I want to waive all fees for new entrepreneurs. For two years, no fees at all for new entrepreneurs. I want to stir up the spirit of entrepreneurship in this city so we can get back to providing jobs for ourselves. And number three, I want to streamline the process for, for small businesses to be able to uh, expand and create more job opportunities for people in the neighborhood. Thank you. Well, I think when we talk about ex-offenders, it's a good example of how we do too little. Uh, and even though we know what needs to be done, we know that there's a need for a re-entry program like the one at Association House and some of the other programs that the Safer Foundation and, and other groups sponsor. The fact of the matter is that they're too small and they're serving too few people and they aren't able to also network and develop the kinds of resources that are needed to deal with housing issues, for example, and to deal, of course, with employment. And we need our city colleges, we need our high schools, we need a lot of places where people should be able to go to develop the kind of training they need that then will connect them with employers. There are businesses out there who will hire ex-offenders, uh, but one of the things that has to happen is we've got to make sure that those businesses feel that the employee that they're going to hire is going to be someone that has the skills that they need. It's up to us to make sure as a community that those individuals have the opportunity to develop those skills. Thank you. The state of Illinois spends $1.8 billion a year incarcerating 45,000 people. That's a cost of $40,000 per person, but we only spend $6,000 to educate a child. 
Something's wrong with that picture. We need to put more on the front end and less on the, the tail end. The thing that we have to do is utilize the resources that we have. We have in the city of Chicago a thing called a capital improvement program. That's an $8.5 billion spending program that addresses capital projects which develop or maintain assets with a long economic life. That money is in place. Our city council voted on that, approved that money. It's a four-year plan. We're going to take $2 billion from that $8.5 billion capital program and give 2,000 small to medium-sized businesses that are industry and geographic diverse, neighborhood businesses, a grant of a million dollars each for jobs creation so that each of them can hire 50 people. That's 100,000 self-perpetuating private sector jobs. That will enable those companies to grow. Thank you. Our next question is also along the lines of economic development. Economic development of our neighborhoods is a vital part of the growth of our communities as well as our city. As mayor, how do you see yourself budgeting for and working with delegate agencies and chambers of commerce? You know, Chicago hasn't had an industry to call its own since the demise of the stockyards. We used to be the hog butcher of the world. Everything that moved in terms of meat came here and was processed here. And then we closed down the stockyards. We piggybacked off of Gary, Indiana with the steel mills. And when the steel mills closed, we came home to higher than usual unemployment. We have 60% unemployment in Lawndale, Woodlawn, and Inglewood, for example. We need a new industry. We didn't fight to make Silicon Valley our industry. The next big industry on the heels of Silicon Valley is a thing called nanotechnology. The young people should get real excited when they hear the word nanotechnology because that's the process by which you make products that are cleaner, lighter, stronger, and more precise. It's manufacturing, using machines that build from the bottom up and not the top down. It is the future. And we're going to fight to make Chicago the world center for nanotechnology development and nanofabrication. We're going to develop public-private partnerships so that we can have the private put up the money and the public put up the muscle and bring that industry here. Thank you. You know, the three of us here tonight have a lot in common. And one of the things that we agree on is that an organized community is a strong community. And what the next administration has to do, and let me tell you that the individuals, candidates who are not here tonight, don't believe in organizing the way we believe in organizing. And we need, we need, we need as a city to establish the, a plan, a citywide plan that ensures that existing community-based organizations can connect throughout neighborhoods and throughout the entire city and develop an economic development plan that is a neighborhoods wide plan that has the city functioning as a partner with you and providing resources for our local chambers as business partners and for our faith-based institutions and for our CBOs and all the other groups that need to be a part of this process. We need to organize in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Yeah, because I don't need to say exactly what he just said, and that's exactly what I was going to say, <laughs> I just want to tell you that, just give you an example, we did a rede redevelopment plan for 79th Street from Halsted to Ashland, a one-mile strip. And in the process, we were able to, it became a redevelopment area and then a TIF district, and we were able to get $52 million in new uh, public and, and private investments in that strip. And one of the programs we used was a facade rebate program. It was for businesses. Some of you all may know something about this. The program was so convoluted that even the, the small business, it's supposed to have been a blessing for small businesses. It was a nightmare for small businesses because it cost them more to do a new facade, which is a new front on their, on their building, using the facade rebate program than it would have cost them if they just came out of their pocket and paid for it. So every business person that tried to use the city's process of getting a rebate on this, these, on this facade, they found they spent more money, spent more time, and was uh, penalized more than people just came right out of their pocket with it. That's because of this organization, and that's because we got a city that got ears but can't hear, eyes but can't see, and a heart but can't feel. It's up to us to organize ourselves to respond to that. Thank you. Our next question um, is about crime and policing. 
The west side of Chicago has had enormous challenges with issues of crime. Um, though communities have begun to implement community policing strategies, policing and police leadership is a very important piece of the crime reduction puzzle. In a lot of our communities, uh, we get frustrated with uh, our police leaders um, with, when we, you know, we call in crimes and things like that. So uh, we're asking you today, how do you plan on addressing the tension and the controversy um, around the superintendent, the current superintendent of the Chicago Police Department, and strengthening community and police relationships, which is essential to fighting crime? I think that communities um, have been, if you go around to any neighborhood in Chicago, just about, and, and take a survey, number one of the top five issues would be the lack of police and community relationships. On May 30th, uh, there was some breaking news that said 22 people had been shot in Chicago in different incidents across the city of Chicago, north, south, east, and west, and, and the police had nobody in custody. That just tells us that the police and the communities do not talk, and that starts from the top down. When you have a mayor that supports people like Burge, uh, who tortured people, and then you're going to fund his, his um, you're going to fund his defense and then fund his pension, and you don't have anything to say about that. Um, when you have, uh, he was a state's attorney before that, and he was a part of that process, you know that the police will be having their way with us. But if we elect a mayor, as myself, who will be committed to you and committed to your life making Chicago a livable city, we know that we will call the police into question and we will have councils, the councils within our neighborhoods will be able to receive reports and we'll be able to push back on a lot of this corruption that we're experiencing every day. Thank you. I don't think we've ever had community policing in the city of Chicago the way it was originally intended when the CAPS program was created. So I want to reinvent community policing in the city of Chicago. I'm even going to change the name uh, so that it truly reflects the intent, the original intent, which is to have foot patrols, which is to have police officers making contacts on a regular basis with businesses and residents in the area. I want police officers who get to know people on a first name basis. And so I want police officers who go into someone's house and find out that their refrigerator went out and that Ms. Jones is in need of assistance. That police officer then makes a referral and makes a contact with a human services agency that can come in and provide that assistance. That's the kind of communication that we want to see throughout our neighborhoods where police officers are working in partnership with community agencies and, and churches to really ensure greater public safety in the community, a partnership that doesn't exist right now. Thank you. CAPS is not it. Thank you. We have to establish irreproachable public safety services, not just in terms of the policies, practices, procedures, equipment, training, deployment, response time, and overall performance, beat alignment and beat assignment, but also in terms of making certain that the entire police and fire department, rank, file, and command is proportionately reflective of the city's population, black, white, Latino, and Asian. We want to make certain that everybody has an opportunity to be a police officer in the city of Chicago and that you have an equal opportunity to have a police officer or a fireman living next door to you. We want our children to see these role models living in their communities. We also want to get these police officers out of their beat cars and have them walk in the playgrounds, have them walk in the parks, have them walk in the schoolyards and proactively get to know our children at a very early age and develop relationships with those children that are not adversarial but that are very productive relationships so that they can find out what's going on in that child's mind and that child feels comfortable talking to them in a time of need. Thank you. Our next question um, is around youth. Uh, underlying the more than 50% dropout rate at Chicago public schools, there is a big student push-out problem. Black and Latino students are being pushed out of schools through discipline policies that over-rely on suspensions for small infractions and police intervention for problems that could be handled another way. Other push-out factors include unchecked harassment by security guards, counseling out at-risk students into leaving schools, and failing to provide adequate support for special needs students. If mayor of Chicago, what would you do to address the push out and criminalizing of students of color in Chicago public schools? 
Very good question. We're going to hold principals and teachers responsible for the welfare of each individual child. When I talk about a superior public school individual, a, a superior public school education for each individual child, I mean that we're going to go in and take an intrinsic look at what that one particular child needs to succeed throughout their high school or their grade school career. They've been pushing children out so that the test scores appear to go up. If you push out all the at-risk students and the students who aren't performing well, then your test scores will naturally seem to be high. Your stay nine level is higher than usual. We're not going to tolerate that when I'm mayor of the city of Chicago. We're going to make certain that we're educating these children so that they can follow their hearts, their minds, and their talents, and that they're not being abused by the system. We're not going to reward schools simply because they have high test scores. We're going to reward them when they have 100% graduation rates. That's what's important to us, making certain that each child that comes in this system is brought through this system, not one size fits all, but giving them what they need to succeed. Thank you. Counseling out students? They should be counseling students in to stay in school. Uh, there should not be any, any, any way that we can allow for a student to be counseled out. I've proposed a re-enrollment program because I was the sponsor of legislation to increase the age that a student must stay in school from 16 to 17, and I did that in order to reduce that push-out rate. But now we have a lot of 17 to 19-year-olds who, according to the law, that we sponsored not that long ago should be allowed and need to be allowed to re-enroll. The question is where? If it doesn't work at one school, then it is the system's responsibility to find an alternative placement. And so I've proposed a re-enrollment program where we hire counselors who will work with each student that has dropped out of school or been pushed out of school, bring them back in, place them in an appropriate setting whether it's an alternative school or, or any other kind of school. And by the way, that includes charter schools who should not be rejecting students from the neighborhoods. They should also be able to enroll students. Thank you. I think the, the major way to stop push-outs is to start measuring them and reporting on them. So, because right now we don't get reports on how many kids were actually pushed out of the school. We found out how many graduated. They don't even tell us too much about how many dropped out of the school. Because they say, well, they didn't drop out, they went somewhere. But where? Nobody knows, right? So measuring it and reporting. Because one of the problems I found we, was that most of the, the communication that be, that's coming out of the district is, is not clear. It's, it's, it's some, in some cases, cases, it's misinformation. In other cases, it's lack of communication to communities. So communities are not even aware of how bad what's going on in the schools and how bad things are. But in order to address the push-out problem, uh, I would first look to, um, and I know they use the police a lot, but I would look to restorative justice, using restorative justice, helping kids understand what their actions mean and how it impacts other people and having them, them to do restorative justice, to, uh, to uh, compensate the person that they've, uh, they've harmed. So I think we should look to restorative justice and not the police, and that will help with the push-out. And also, there's so much violence in the schools we need to make sure that we're providing safe passage for all of our schools around the city of Chicago. Thank you. Our next question is a, another education issue. Uh, what role should the mayor play in ensuring that there are enough quality, affordable, early learning programs in all neighborhoods? So you are giving us these questions. We got 60 seconds to answer them. Is that 60 <laughs> seconds? I mean, man, we ain't nowhere to get all this stuff out in 60 seconds. And I just lose 15 of mine just now. Because this is a simple answer. The mayor has to advocate and he has to encourage people to advocate for more support from the state and federal government to bring back the dollars that we need. We know we do not get our fair share of dollars from the state government because um, the, way, the, the way our schools are funded is it's wrong. Uh, so we don't get it. So other schools in other parts of the state get more money than we do. And it's supposed to be all public education. So to me, if you got a public washroom, both on the west side or the south side, they both should look the same. So the public education system should all be funded the same. So it's the mayor's job to stand up and say to the state, look, you got to give us our fair share of money, and not the mayor by himself, but to him to stir up people in the communities to also begin to demand the funding uh, resources come to our neighborhoods that we deserve. Thank you. You know, I was a state senator for 20 years, and one of the things I did was work with community 
organizations. And I worked with the Northwest Neighborhood Federation to establish more preschool slots uh, in the Belmont Cragen area. When we went to CPS, they said to us, we don't have any money uh, and, and we don't have enough slots and we don't have the space. So I said, let's start with the space. And we looked at a school and we said, you've got morning preschool, afternoon preschool. I said, let's start a third shift preschool from three until five, a third group coming in. They said, parents are not gonna go for that. It's too late. We said, let's try it. Well, they agreed to it. Within days, 400 families had signed up for the three to five slot. And that is still operating today. And they found the money because early childhood education is really probably one of the most important programs that we have. That's when you have a captive parent and you can work with the parent to have the parent becomes the child's first teacher rather than their second teacher. Thank so we need more early childhood education programs. Thank you. Preschools and early learning centers are the first determinants of how well children will do in school. So it's important that we get our children into school as soon as we possibly can. Let them start learning as soon as they're able to pay attention. The next most important thing is to ensure that we're using funds that would otherwise be used for babysitting purposes. We have to direct those funds into educational programs for preschoolers, toddlers, and ultimately our kindergarten students. We have to make certain that they're learning the kinds of things that are going to help them develop and grow in life. You don't talk baby talk to children. You talk up to children. You teach them the skills that they're going to need to progress from one level to the next level. And as long as we're doing that in our early learning centers, we can justify spending money, which also improves the quality of life for people as we go on and on and on. Thank you. We have one more question that was developed out of the questions we had today, and then we're going to proceed to questions from the audience members that signed up in the beginning of the meeting. I'm going to call those people's names so that they know to begin to um, migrate to the microphone that's on the stand right here. Uh, the first person we had signed up was Edward Alonzo, Charlie Red Riddit, Hema Gallete, Tomas Gallete, Jermaine Nunnery, William Lyles, Devin Reed, Leanne uh, Patterson, Venus Fortune, and Martine uh, Carrero. And we may not be able to get to everyone, but um, since you did sign up, we're gonna try to get through as many questions as possible, okay? The last question, um, the Chicago Reader recently published an article exposing uh, the major problem of racial segregation in Chicago neighborhoods and how this issue um, has been ignored in the mayoral race. If elected, how will you address the issues of economic disparities and racial segrega segregation in Chicago neighborhoods? Ready? Yes. We got to create a middle class in every neighborhood. And you can't create a middle class if people don't have jobs that pay a living wage, that allow you to be able to provide for your family, allow you to be able to buy a home, and be able to stabilize the community that way. And so that's what has to happen. As long as we're not doing that, we're not creating the middle class that is what stabilizes communities, that brings people together, and allows lower income individuals to live also in an economically and racially segregated setting. We have economic segregation and racial segregation comes primarily because of our inability to develop our neighborhoods for everyone. We have development for some, but not development for all. And that's what has to change in the city of Chicago in order to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to be lifted. Because we all have our God-given talents. We're all capable of exceeding, of exceeding in terms of our goals. Thank you. We have 77 neighborhoods. 22 of those neighborhoods are 90% black. We're the most racially segregated city in America. I'm the one candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago who can unify this city by promoting cultural and diversity sensitivity amongst people of all ages, races, 
socioeconomic backgrounds, all religious persuasions, all sexual orientations, all physical and mental disabilities or limitations because I recognize that none of us is any better than the rest of us. It starts with the mayor who's willing to set a tone in the city of Chicago that says everyone is welcome in every single neighborhood. Feel comfortable, feel free. We're going to go back to our neighborhood festivals and invite people to come into different neighborhoods and get to know people in those neighborhoods and find out what their proclivities are, what their habits are, what they like to do. Examine their food, taste their food, and see if you like it. That will encourage people to begin to move into neighborhoods in the city of Chicago that they once thought to be foreign. We got to unify this city. We got to bring people together, and it starts with all of us. Thank you. To, re to deal with the economic disparity, we know, as I said earlier, that 55% of the adult black males have felony records in Chicago. And also that the unemployment rate, though it's 10% across the state, in the black communities and some other, and also in some Latino communities, the unemployment rate is above above 35 percent. So, in order to deal with the economic d disparity, I think number one, we need to remove the barriers that keep people from being able to, to work. And so that means removing barriers to work for ex-offenders and also for new Americans. Because if people can, if we can open the doors up in this city to make make it a common thing for anybody to be able to get a job and something unusual if someone is not able to get a job, then we open the doors for economic growth. And as far as uh, racial segregation, my goal is to develop a, an affordable housing plan for all 77 communities in Chicago so that in every community in this city there's affordable housing because part of the racial, dis uh, r racial segregation is about income as well. So we will remove that. And also I will promote cross-community celebrations and cross-community planning so that Inglewood, maybe Inglewood and, and Rogers Park is working together and so on and so on to build, uh, make the kind of change we deserve. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to have uh, those folks that I just named off go and proceed to the microphone for your questions. The uh, candidates, um, not all the candidates have to respond to these questions, but you will have a, another minute to respond to these questions. Um, and uh, uh, right now, I forgot to talk about this at the beginning of the, the program, but I do want to let audience members know where some of the other candidates are running for office are tonight. or what they told us they were doing, so. Kara <laughs> um, uh, Mosley Brown did have our event on her schedule. Uh, she did not confirm with us, but uh, she did know about tonight's event. Uh, Gary Chico um, said he had another uh, um, a, a occasion to go to, so he couldn't come tonight. And uh, candidate Rahm Emanuel never communicated with us at all. So that lets you know where everybody else is this evening, okay? Don't vote for Rahm. <laughs> Now, I have uh, 8 o'clock that I'm gonna, I need to leave here at 8 o'clock. It actually starts at 8, but I'm going to get there a few minutes late. We should be done by 8 o'clock. Okay. We'll be good. And, uh, well, we're going to leave some more t uh, room for some of those community organizations to come up and talk about their work. So we may not be able to get to all the questions, and I'll be making sure that I manage our time well. Okay? Okay. And we don't have to answer every question. No. Uh, all the candidates do not have to answer all of the questions, but those who feel uh, passionate about responding, um, please do so. Thank you. I can hear you. It's on. But we can hear you. My name is Edward Alonzo. I'm a longtime patient of uh, uh, one of the mental health centers in the city of Chicago. I'm also on the Community Mental Health Board of Chicago, Stop Group, Southside Together, Organizing for Power. And um, basically, our 12 centers in the city are in crisis due to uh, budget and staff cuts. Um, myself, as well as thousands of people in this city, are affected by that. It's uh, an important issue for many people. Um, we have fought in the past, a couple years ago, to, to save uh, the clinics. Actually, four of them were given a reprieve by uh, Mayor Daley. Um, just uh, want to hear basically your, uh, your comments. Uh, we need these centers to be uh, open, public, and adequately staffed and funded. Um, just if you... Uh, talk about uh, your concern for this as well. And also, please, uh, if I could say tomorrow, uh, some of us, anybody here interested and available can uh, go to City Hall, fifth floor, 11 o'clock. We're going to uh, gather and uh, 
have a press conference to, to demonstrate our, our concern for this uh, important matter. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate you for fighting for what you know is right. Because if we be silent, we got to know no good thing is coming to us. But when we organize ourselves and speak up, that's when we can get the change that we deserve. Uh, so the only way, reason why that program even exists now is because you stood up and said something. Whoever becomes the mayor, whoever is in that seat, we have to continue to stand up and say something because we have to fight to be sure that the dollars that we need come to our community in the way that they need to. If, if not, who's going to get the money is whoever is making the most noise. We as a community have to recognize that mental health issues it challenges every single one of our communities and every single one of our neighborhoods. And the last thing we need is for our mental health clinics to be closed down. So I am committed to you. I'm committed to your, your cause. But I'm saying to you, even as mayor, you need to continue to fight. You need to keep pushing it because until you make it real to the, to the person that's sitting in our fifth floor, it won't be real. Thank you. Okay. Any other candidates want to respond? I was uh, a provider of mental health services when I was executive director of association housing. Prior to that, I worked for the uh, Pilsen Little Village Community Mental Health Center. I've signed the pledge. Uh, that you have used with all the candidates uh, because I'm fully committed. Uh, but I want to remind you um, that the organizing that gets done around this issue is extremely important. Many of those clinics would have been closed last year if you hadn't been aggressive. You need to do that again. Uh, you have allies here, but I, I keep repeating this. Uh, the individuals who are not here tonight those who the newspapers keep saying are leading in the polls are the individuals that you have to worry about. You shouldn't be worried about us. You have to worry about those who are not here and, and, and make sure that we have a huge voter turnout because otherwise then I see big cuts in, on the horizon here if, if, if one of us is not elected. Thank you. As many of you know, I ran against Mayor Daley in the last election for reasons like that. And if Mayor Daley were running this time, I would be the only candidate running against him. I stood with STOP in the organizations to stop the closing of the mental health hospitals. I was out there in the cold when we had press conferences on 63rd Street out in the cold. I was there when we were down at City Hall fighting to keep those things. I was at the board meetings of the mental health board uh, arguing to keep those mental health clinics and giving good reason to keep them. We were featured on television time and time again, and we had impact. When we come together, when we fight, we win. And that's why I'm telling everybody in this audience, punch 11. Punch 11 and let Bill dock walls. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to have a mayor who will stand with you because you'll have a mayor who's been standing with you on issues all along. Thank you. Buenas noches. Perdón, traigo a mi hija como traductora en inglés. Le voy a hacer esta pregunta especialmente a los tres candidatos. Y tengo un orgullo de tener a Miguel, a la señora y al otro candidato porque yo sé que están comprometidos con la comunidad. Se muestra la, el poco interés que hay de los, de los candidatos, por ejemplo, el señor Rico, Manuel, otras personas, no tienen interés porque no han trabajado nunca con la comunidad. Yo hablo como el organizador comunitario, tuve el orgullo de organizar la primera huelga grande en Chicago para obtener un high school en el barrio de La Villita. Tuvimos 19 días y la ganamos. Qué pena que no está el señor Rico, eh, Chico para hacerle la pregunta ¿qué se hicieron con los 30 millones de pesos que cuando él era presidente, miembro de la Junta de Escolar, se hicieron, se perdieron? Bueno, la pregunta mía es la siguiente. Especialmente, ¿cuál es el, la plataforma para trabajar con la persona, las personas de la tercera edad? Especialmente, no somos minoría los de la tercera edad, somos mayoría. No queremos que los traten como tipo, como personas de segunda y tercera clase. Somos los primeros, somos de primera clase, porque hemos hecho algo en este país. Como inmigrante lo digo. Thank you. I translate. Hello. 
Um, first of all, his name is uh, Tomas Gaetan. He says he is very proud to have all the three candidates here because it's demonstrated that they have a real commitment uh, to the community uh, as opposing to the three candidates that are not here that are obviously don't have an interest in the community. He says, as an ex-community organizer, he was the organizer uh, who led the hunger strike, one of the uh, successful hunger strike for the Little Village High School on uh, 31st and I messed up the mic? Help me. Okay. Um, so he said, unfortunately, Mr. Chico's not here. He said, but if he were here, he would like to ask him uh, what happened to the $30 million that were allocated for the Little Village High School. Um, since he's not here, that's a question that we need to keep on asking and reminding Mr. Chico that he has nowhere to be. Oh, let, me, let me just translate my fault. <laughs> so then uh, the, the question is to the candidates, uh, how, what is the mechanism that you would use to work with senior citizens? He said, we are not third class citizens, we are first class citizens because we have done something this, for this country, um, not only with our experience and time, but as immigrants. So that's what he asked him, how will he work uh, with, with senior citizens? Okay. Um, before the candidates respond, uh, we do want to be mindful of the time, so we want to keep the comments and the questions really, really brief. But also, we're going to ask the candidates if you all could be really, really brief, and can 30 we... Seconds. 30 seconds. There 30 we go. Seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Our senior citizens really are our most precious commodities. Our children come second. Senior citizens have given a lot. They've made us who we are. The important thing is that we don't want our senior citizens to begin to vegetate. We expect that they're going to live to be 120 years of age with modern technology and medicine doing the kinds of things that it's doing. So we want them to stay abreast of technology, stay abreast of computers. We want them to contribute their wisdom because senior citizens have wisdom that they've garnered over a period of lots of years. And they didn't get old being dumb or being <laughs> stupid. They're wise people. So we want to make certain that we're loving our senior citizens and giving them the, the, those things that they Thank need you. to prosper. Thank you. Yeah. I, I've talked about during the campaign about creating a youth corps in the city of Chicago uh, because we have Peace Corps, we have AmeriCorps, we have all kinds of corps, but we need a city of Chicago youth corps. We also need a senior youth corps, seniors working with yes. youth in the city of Chicago, working as volunteers in our schools, working in our community centers, and, and being role models and parents and surrogate parents and, and caregivers and, and guardians of, of, our, of our young people in the city of Chicago. We need them everywhere. We need our seniors to be very active and very Thank visible. You. Okay, to keep this short, if I'm privileged to become your next mayor, I will immediately hire Mr. Devaye to run that program. You saw that passion he had. <laughs> Okay, our next question. Hello? Okay. Um, so I just want to um, follow up with, we know who's not here and why they're not here, right? And my, what I'm going to propose to Mr. Doc Walls and to Dr. Patricia Watkins is if we don't get together and support Miguel Del Valle, we will lose this. So you don't have to hire him, sister. You can work with him. And so, Doc Walls, you said about working together. Let's work together in a campaign that we will okay. win. We will not let the machine continue Thank to you. do what they were doing. So I ask you, you, will you join? If you're talking about really changing this city, will we join and work together, Latino, black, and brown, together? Thank you. Thank to take you. this city back for us. Thank you. Do any of the candidates want to respond to that question? Well, I, it, it, well, well, first of all, I'll respond to that. You know, we are friends up here, but it's, it's beyond friends. It, 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 there's a mutual respect here because of what our vision is in the city of Chicago. We share in that vision. But the challenge here is making sure that people turn out to vote because I'm confident that if we have a high voter turnout in the city of Chicago, Mr. Rahm Emanuel is not going to get the 50% plus one that will end this election on February 22nd. Thank you. And, and I'm also confident that Gary Chico will not be in second place Thank because Gary Chico and Rahm Emanuel are cut from the Thank same you. cloth. Thank you. I also want to respond to that. Keep in mind, 
This election will be won by the person who gets the most votes, not by the one that the media says is supposed to win. Don't let the media convince you to go out and vote for somebody that isn't good for your interest. Go out and vote your conscience. Vote for the person that you feel will best represent your needs and take care of the business for the people of the city of Chicago. And don't worry about wasting your vote. There's no such thing. As long as you vote, your vote will count. Study show that a student that a student that has been suspended just one is more than three times more likely to drop out of school. Historical justice programs and school, uh, schools hold students accountable without relying on suspensions, expulsions, and arrests. Each of you have received information about the city where I hope I mean High Hope's campaign to reduce suspension and expulsion in CPS by fully back in restorative justice approaches. Will you endorse the High Hopes campaign and meet with us within 30 days of becoming mayor? I definitely will meet with you within 30 days of becoming mayor. I don't know the, all the particulars on High Hopes, but I am a definitely a proponent of restorative justice because I think that's the answer that we need across the board to improve our neighborhoods. I, I've, been to, I've been to the meetings uh, and I signed the pledge also to support fully restorative justice in our schools. And I commend the High Hopes campaign for the wonderful work that you've done. And I've already indicated that I will meet with you within the first 30 days. Thank you. I also support the High Hopes initiative and I'll meet with you within 10 days. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so. Um, what is your leadership strategy for bringing to light and eliminating corruption, nepotism, and waste in City Hall and the City Departments? 30 seconds, and let me just say that <laughs> before people begin. All right, oh, go ahead. Oh, man. <laughs> I know, that's why I wanted to remind everyone. Corruption in 30 seconds? You kidding? You start by leading by example. I do not accept campaign contributions from anyone contracting with the city. Every alderman in the city of Chicago and every elected official should do the same. That's how you end pay to play in the city of Chicago. And of course, you also add positions to the inspector general's office to conduct program audits so that we can uncover, uncover waste, inefficiency, and corruption. You take steps necessary to make sure that you end patronage you. hiring in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Those are the things that I will do. I'm the only candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago who believes in term limits. I don't believe that any mayor should serve more than two consecutive four-year terms. Eight years and you're out. Everybody else wants to be mayor for life. I think that's where it starts. When you think that you're going to be mayor for life, you take liberties that you otherwise wouldn't take because you don't believe that anybody's going to uncover them before the statutes of limitations expire. I also believe that we ought to have a strong whistleblower program. I believe that we ought to have subpoena power for our ethics committee. I believe that we ought to have performance bonds required for people who are in sensitive positions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for staying brief. First of all, I, as I'm a certified public accountant, so I know that we need to do a forensic audit. We need to go through the books and we need to find the fraud. We need to look for the waste and we need to look for the corruption. And then we need to prosecute those that, have, uh, that, that are committing these crimes. Also, I want to establish a new whistleblowers program that celebrates the whistleblowers. Every time somebody come up and tell us somebody's stealing our money, we want to pay them. I want people to get paid for blowing the whistle and protect it. Because right now, they're not protected, and neither do they get paid. So we want to pay them and protect them. And then we want to invite the feds to come sit at our table and learn all about us. Because if it hadn't been for the federal government, we wouldn't be, have broken all these corruption schemes that we have right now. Thank you. My name is Charlie Reddit. Uh, we all know that today is, uh, well, this month is a commemoration of black history. Sometimes I'm insulted because of the contributions that black folks have contributed to America and the world abroad. But just for February, just to have just a small amount of time to exercise that soulfully, I find it somewhat insulting, but we have to deal with that. I'd like to greet you in uh, peace. Assalamu alaikum. And also, Thank you, Asante, and 
All right. And jumbo, meaning hello. So listen, uh, what measures will you take to stabilize cultural identity? Because so often, many of us are not symbolized in our neighborhood. I mean, we don't have uh, anything to, that we can uh, relate to. And uh, well, we know that Africa is so diverse uh, with, with language that we don't, it's so hard to say that we can speak just one language. But what, would, what measures will you take to, I mean, to stabilize cultural identity? Thank you. Well, number one, uh, as an organizer, I formed a coalition called United Congress of Community okay. and Religious Organizations. And what it is is a multi-ethnic alliance of community groups and individuals that are working to promote our own identities among other groups of people. So we had a series that we called the lived experiences. So it was the lived experiences of African Americans in the U.S., the lived experiences of the Mexican American in the U.S. And we attended those. It was very high, high uh, attendance to those. And what it provided was an opportunity for each of us to be able to tell our stories in a way that helped the people that we were speaking to learn our stories and be able to tell those stories again. So I will continue to support that kind of program. Thank you. Okay. And I agree with, with Patricia, um, but I want to reach the point in the city of Chicago when we're not describing these activities as a program, but rather as a way of living, okay. a way of living where we are in a multicultural society that cherishes, that respects, that embraces fully the unique aspects of each culture and then allows us to come together so that we could see our commonality, so that you could see that my grandfather was black. Now he you was, see that. Thank you. but he was from Puerto Rico, but he was brought over by the Spaniards. And his ancestors were brought over. Let's look at that commonality Thank while ensuring that our institutions are promoting mm. the culture through our educational system as well as through our cultural institutions Thank in you. every neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Davide. I talked earlier about the neighborhood festivals. Um, and through those neighborhood festivals, we can really begin to meld Chicago into one big city we do have to stop distinguishing between blacks, whites, Latinos, and Asians at some point. Our children are doing a lot better job than we did at it. They get along with one another, they play with one another, they coalesce with one another, they build coalitions across racial and cultural lines. We're doing good. We just have to get rid of those influences in our society which still remind them that they have to be different. They don't have to be different. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have one. I'll be very short with no, this. No, can we? Because Please. we got five more people and we got, only got five minutes to go. <laughs> but remember, we do have that option of the portal and all that good stuff. So uh, definitely, if anybody else in the audience has some more questions, we'll take care of that. Go ahead, sir. How you doing? My name is uh, William Lyles. Uh, I have a nonprofit organization called the Carter G. Wilson Afro American History Club. And what I do is I go out to uh, high school, churches, grammar schools. I teach you how to be orators, how to recite poetry. My question is. What would you guys do to help a struggling organization as we have in our communities, which I'm right here from East Garfield, to you know, get out here and help us with our youth because they're standing on the corners with nothing to do, not just in this neighborhood, but all through the city. So help us Thank out. You. Thank and you. And the other three candidates not here just lost my vote. Good. Fantastic. I hope they never had it. Yep. I'll come out and I'll work with you. That's one of the things that the mayor has to do. The mayor of New York City is common enough to ride the subways. Our mayor doesn't do things like that. Any of us would do that. I can assure you, we're common folks. We believe in people. So we'd support organizations. I'd support an organization like yours by one, coming out and drawing attention to it, and two, pro providing funds, putting the muscle on some private corporations to give you what you need so that you can reach more people and have the accoutrements that you need to make it a first class program that's really able to get results. You know, I, I ran community organizations for, for 20 years. I started many, I started many programs. I started an alternative high school that's still in place today, 25 years later. And I believe in community institution building. And what you are doing is building an institution. Institutions can be built by volunteers. You need resources. So what do you do? You combine and you network and you look for ways of 
gaining the support from other institutions within the community so that you could build that foundation that Thank allow you. it to exist long after you're gone because that is how you build communities Thank by you. building institutions. You know, I, I started an organization in 1995 and grew that organization, the nonprofit, to $3 million a year. And it's a struggle. Every year we have to fight to get those dollars. You know, when people think, oh, you got a $3 million budget, you're doing well. No, that means that I'm staying up even more hours trying to make sure I have $3 million next year. One of the things I think that we miss sometimes, and it may be, a, be an advantage for you to think about this, is becoming, uh, have a nonprofit, but also become a for-profit. Build a skill, the skill level and the capacity that you need through my new entrepreneur's program and start selling your services in some instances. You can also have a nonprofit. But we can move forward uh, Thank you. and get money and opportunities that don't exist to nonprofits. You can get it as a for profit. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question. Good evening. My name is Venus Fortner. And I have a two question. It's, it's a two part question. First question goes back to when you were talking about the property taxes. Many seniors don't know about the, their exemptions. In my neighborhood, on my block alone, I had to inform at least 10. As mayor, because I am still undecided, for this question, what will you do to help the seniors or to even send someone out to look at their property taxes and adjust it affordably for them? Mm -hmm. The second question is overcrowding in the schools. That is a major problem. Okay, so uh, there's two questions on two different levels. Right, so actually let's have either the candidate, can we have you all decide which one you want to uh, answer? Okay. Well, I, I, both of them are very important. Well, and if we can do it in, in 30 but, seconds, but, yeah. But, but you're absolutely right about the senior exemption. And, 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 but beyond that, it's the whole assessment process and how, how seniors are affected by an assessment process that occurs once every three years that is not sensitive to the declining or changing property values. Uh, and so seniors are lost. They don't know how to appeal. They don't know what to do. They don't know exactly what, 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 what it is that they need to do in order to make sure that their property taxes are as low as, as they can get. Okay. It's a major issue, and it's a matter of working with community organizations and contracting with community organizations right. so that you Thank can you, go Mr. door to door and reach these seniors. We know who they are. We know mm -hmm. where they live. We know what their age is. Thank we have you, to reach Mr. them. First of all, as mayor, I'll do public service announcements on television and on radio for our senior citizens. Second, we'll make certain that our water department includes in the bills that we send out to our senior citizens a notice telling them that it's time to apply for your exemption. We'll also get Commonwealth Edison and others to do the exact same thing so that everything they receive in the mail from the city or utility en encourages them to go out and, and apply for those exemptions. I'm the only candidate that has, that has committed to funding community organizing. And the reason why is just because of reasons. Are you going to fund it too? All right. All right. Are you going to fund community? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, well, I know I was the first one to say that I was going to fund community organizing. Yeah, I said, <laughs> okay, sure. That was another election. That was for governor. Anyway, so um, I'm committed to funding community organizing because I know that the answers to many of our problems lie with, right within the community. We cannot just keep looking to the government, thinking the government is going to solve all our problems. Why don't we fund the people that make these things happen on the ground? And I'm willing to fund community organizing to watch out for our seniors. Thank you. Um, right now, we're going to let the candidates um, do their one-minute conclusions. Can we get three questions just in case we want to hit those three? OK, yeah. Why don't we have all of the, the, the last three folks uh, say their questions? That's a good idea, Dr. Watkins. Okay. All right. All, no, uh, the extra folks in the line, we want to just only have people who signed up, and there was just three people on the line. So, But uh, I do need to make one more announcement for questions beyond the three that are in line right now. Uh, can go to the New Communities Project in the West Humble Park portal, and we're going to email some of our questions to the candidates' campaigns and see if we can get them to email some information to us and post it on those portals, okay? All right, go ahead. 
Just ask the question. I want to hear him. Um, we all know that the city of Chicago faces multiple issues, but I believe that the biggest issue is the issue that our children, our youth are facing in the city of Chicago, such as the zero tolerance policy, which is denying our students the rights to an education. So my question to you is, can you specify what can be done to reaffirm the idea of the rights to a free edu to, a, to an education? Thank you. All right, and then the next question, go ahead. My name is Giovanna Fassett. I am running in the 27th Ward for Alderman. My question is to you, what are you guys going to do to make sure, there's, to make sure that we get all our services on the west side so there is no disparity between the west side, down east, the south side? And how will you work with us? Well, I'd like to know, how would you eliminate the high truck scandal and how, why would you all get rid of our police superintendent, Jody Weiss? Well, I'm the only candidate that said I would not get rid of Jody Weiss just because everybody else is saying it. I'm, I'm saying that murders have come down. Also, we have lower police uh, complaints, uh, police cases, complaint cases. And I think that's important. We need to look at that before we start talking about throwing people away. And number two, um, I think we need real-term reporting in order to uh, report on what's happening in communities, what services the people are getting. I've committed to putting a budget on the internet that tracks dollars down to the community level. So you know on the west side or the south side how much, money is being, how much money is being given to each community. And lastly, to my brother, restorative justice is the answer. I believe restorative justice will help us to keep our kids in school and promote our children and, and give, teach them what's right and how to, how to approach problems that they face. And, God bless all of you. My number is seven, punch seven, Patricia Watkins for mayor. I, I, I just want to address the question regarding services. We heard from an aldermanic candidate who asked that question. That's what you have aldermen for. And if your alderman is not working hard enough to make sure that your area is adequately serviced, then you need to get rid of the aldermen. It's as simple as that. And you need, as community organizations, not only to hold the mayor accountable, but you need to hold the aldermen accountable. And you can't have an alderman that doesn't make a move until they get permission from the fifth floor of City Hall. You need an alderman who's going to fight for you on an ongoing basis and earn that position that you've given him when you voted for him. Thank you. The mayor is a leader of the city. The mayor has to make certain that everybody's concerns are heard and that everybody's concerns are addressed. That's the thing that I will do as mayor of the city of Chicago. We'll make certain that the aldermen are empowered to provide the services. We're talking about going to a grid system and not going uh, uh, along political lines. So the aldermen will get support from the city of Chicago in ways that you haven't seen yet. 311 is another important thing. We have to make certain that 311 operators are responding to people adequately, appropriately, and instantaneously. We also have to make certain that we move away from a zero tolerance policy and, and develop a policy that ensures that everybody is treated the same, equally, fairly, but that situations are dealt with swiftly and with judiciousness. We also have to make certain that in the city of Chicago, we're fighting to make Chicago just one city with one set of rules. When you have people who take millions of dollars in campaign contributions, as some of our opponents have, you end up with people who are walking, talking, IOU machines. They can't respond to the needs of the people of the city of Chicago. They end up having to respond to the needs only of those big contributors who gave millions of dollars to their campaign. That's how we'll resolve the problems that we have in the city of Chicago and ensure everybody's taken care of. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Let's give all of the candidates a round of applause for joining us today.